This course is all about managing those wide area networks and the Cisco equipment that runs these wide area networks or WANs. So in this video, let's cover some of the content that we'll be going over in this course. Here's all the modules of this course. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna kick this off talking about wide area networks. This is gonna set that foundational knowledge of what WANs are and that we're going to build off of in all of the other modules. So we'll get into the concepts of this wide area network linking all of these sites of the business together and the individual technologies and connections that we could use to interconnect these. Once we have that great foundational knowledge around wide area networks, we're gonna start configuring the links between our routers on our network. Whereas our LANs are gonna be these local area connections and configuring those local area connections, we really need to get talking across our network. And this is where our WAN technologies come into play. And so we'll be configuring the links between these different routers here. And where our LAN technologies are using protocols such as ethernet, we're gonna start learning some other protocols like HDLC and point-to-point -point protocol. We'll even take a look at the frames and what the frames look like because the header on these frames look quite a bit different depending on which technology you're using. Just having our devices connected and able to communicate between those devices doesn't give us the full picture though. There still needs to be some information on each one of these routers in order to route traffic from one location to another. So let's start talking about routing and what routing looks like. We'll start looking at the parts that make this all happen, such as the routers and what routers do, the function of the routers. We'll look at routes and what routes look like and the routing table. You'll need to get really familiar with the different components of what a route is. So here's just an example of the routes that we're going to look at and how these different routes show up in a routing table. And we'll need to be able to pick out certain information and identify certain information within the routing table. And of course, these different routers need to learn of the different networks to be able to create these routes and what the routes look like. So we're gonna take a look at different ways to do that, both statically assigning routes on a router or dynamically assigning it through a dynamic routing protocol. And we'll take a look at concepts like how it's going to choose the best route to get to a final destination. There's also some tricks that Cisco equipment uses to really speed up this process and use less resources. So we'll look, take a look at different processes that the router goes through and how it can speed up this process with things like Cisco Express Forwarding. Once we have a great concept of what routing looks like, then we're gonna move into creating static routes and configuring communication across our network using these static routes. For our larger networks, we probably wouldn't use static routes as our primary method to configure our network for communication. However, even on our larger networks, even if we are using a dynamic routing protocol, we probably would wanna install at least some static routes within our network. So we're gonna take a look at a lot of different types of static routes and how to configure it on our network. We'll see how we can have a fully functioning enterprise network set up with just static routes. However, we probably wanna learn also about dynamic routing protocols to help it manage these larger networks. So we'll get into dynamic routing protocols and what those look like. There are a lot of different types of routing protocols out there. There's interior gateway protocols, exterior gateway protocols, distance vector, link state, and path vector protocols, and a lot of different options that we could use to configure our network. So we'll talk about the different types and the pros and cons of each of those types. We'll also get into the different components that make up a dynamic routing protocol. And since RIP is a more basic routing protocol, we're gonna start taking a look at RIP and how it transfers the information back and forth so these routers know of all different types of networks. This is gonna give you a good overview of what dynamic routing protocols are. And we'll even configure it on a network to see how it can communicate across the network. Once we have a great foundational knowledge around dynamic routing protocols, then we're gonna get into Open Shortest Path First or OSPF. Now OSPF is a very large protocol and there's a lot to OSPF. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna break that into four different modules. The first module is just gonna be the basic settings because it can be really basic in how we set up OSPF initially. So we'll talk about just some of the basic implementations of OSPF. OSPF is what we call a link state protocol. And so it has a lot more tables involved when it's communicating across the board. 
and the different routers get a much better picture of what the network looks like. So we're gonna talk about that whole process of how it gets a whole map of the network communicated amongst all of the routers within this network. It uses something that's called an SPF tree, and we'll get into how that SPF tree process is formed and created. We'll actually learn about OSPF, then jumping into configuring OSPF so we have a good idea of what OSPF looks like, and then we'll go back talking about more ways that we can configure OSPF. But as I mentioned, OSPF is a very large protocol. So then we'll get into some more detailed settings that we can configure within OSPF. OSPF has a lot of different types of packets that it uses and transfers back and forth. So we're gonna talk about those different OSPF packet types and what their purposes are. And we'll talk about some other configurations and concepts such as OSPF areas and where we might want to use OSPF areas. Since OSPF has a lot of different communications that go back and forth, it makes it a very powerful protocol. However, it can get very chatty and it becomes a real issue when you're talking about OSPF multi-access networks. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna get into what the OSPF multi-access networks look like, what the issue is, and how we can adapt to that issue, how we can really change OSPF to make sure that we don't run into issues when it's communicating back and forth. And the way it solves this problem is it selects a main router that we call a designated router. And it will do most of the communication across the, the network. We'll also talk about a backup designated router and all the other routers and how they communicate. Then we'll take all of these concepts and we'll roll it into our project. We'll start configuring our project to be set up with OSPF and get that communication going back and forth. And in the end, we will have a working network that we're gonna use throughout the rest of this course. And most networks nowadays use either network address translation or port address translation. So we're gonna get into NAT and PAT and what that looks like. And this is necessary because most businesses and homes are using some sort of private addressing that's not routable on the outside to the internet. And so what we have to do is we have to translate from those private addresses into something that is going to be routable on the internet. And Cisco uses certain terminology that we're going to need to know when setting up these NAT and PAT connections. We're gonna get into the difference of what NAT and PAT is, network address translation and port address translation. And generally speaking, we just lump it all into NAT. We just call it NAT. However, technically speaking, we're actually, most businesses and homes are doing PAT. And there's a lot of common configurations that are out there. So we're gonna start looking at the common configurations and configuring our network for both NAT and PAT. Then of course we need to apply this to our network. So we're gonna get into our project and start configuring it. In the end, this network that we're setting up will actually be reachable to the outside world. Then we're gonna get into access control list or ACLs. ACLs is what we're gonna put on firewalls and routers and layer three switches to be able to start controlling the traffic flow. That is there's certain traffic that we may wanna deny or certain traffic that we may want to accept. So we'll take a look at how access control lists do exactly that. We're gonna get into the differences between standard and extended access control lists and numbered and named ACLs. So we'll talk about a lot of different configurations and how we can configure it on our devices. Then we'll take those ACL concepts and apply it to our project. What we're gonna do is we're gonna come up with a scenario of what we need to accomplish on our network. Then we'll build an access control list to measure up against that scenario so that way we can implement those changes within our network. And with each one of these projects, when we're configuring it on our network, we're gonna go through a troubleshooting process. You can see what the troubleshooting process may look like for you, and also we'll troubleshoot some common issues that might arise when you're doing these configurations. Then we're gonna get into tunneling traffic and VPNs. We're gonna get into some different types of tunnels and what they look like. For instance, the Generic Routing Encapsulation, or GRE. We're gonna take a look at multi-protocol label switching and how it tunnels traffic from one location to another. And we'll talk about IPsec, a common protocol that we use for secure tunneling. And we'll get into VPNs that utilize IPsec or other protocols to implement secure communication across networks. 
and we'll look at Cisco's DMVPN, which really takes VPNs to the next level and really makes it easier to manage larger enterprise networks. There are a lot of concepts that we need to cover and go over, and some of these concepts are fairly complex. However, I've broken these down into these modules so we can stair step into this information. And as long as you understand each of those steps along the way before proceeding to the next step, then we're gonna step into this information and we're going to crush it. And I hope you really enjoy going through this content because it really is very cool information.